Welcome back to Everyone Has a Story, where we share true tales about everyday life. I'm Jim Great Elk Waters, and this week's adventure is about American Indians, or Native Americans, both terms controversial. But what happened wasn't controversial to my father, Chief Ten Moons, and his Indian school incident. It all occurred in the fall of 1910, near my father's sixth birthday. But first, this is what inspired me to share this story with you, an adventure gone awry. Recently, I visited the Heard Museum in Phoenix to explore the galleries of the Native American art and history of the Southwest Indians. Many of the exhibits were poignant, educational, and inspiring. I was particularly drawn to the gallery exhibit on the government Indian schools because of my personal connection. Their contemporary exhibit, however, was most disappointing, as it was very politicized. It showed our people as victims. This is as far from the truth as possible. Europeans and later Americans did, in fact, take the homelands from the many people who had inhabited what is now the United States and Canada. In a massive action, the federal governments desperately attempted to civilize the indigenous people. However, they only partially succeeded in limiting our languages, culture, and traditions that are returning today. Although they have succeeded in making some of our people dependent upon government charity, the many tribes, organizations, and familial groups of the First People are actively teaching the heritage that was once thought lost throughout the time of assimilation, and to this day, the elders, storytellers, and medicine people have retained that which makes us, the 50-plus nations of the indigenous entities, uniquely American Indian. We were never victims, nor have we ever thought of ourselves such. I personally have only met a few people who believe that they are victims of America's sad, historic, cultural, ethnic cleansing. This, however, is a sobering footnote of the groupthink of some. But it doesn't reflect the exemplary positive lives and the extraordinary achievement of many of our people today. But back to the exhibit. Exploring the Indian School exhibit prompted me to remember the story shared with me of what happened that faithful week to my dad, Chief Ten Moons, and about his childhood incident in the Northwest Territory Indian School. My dad was born in the fall of 1904 in the small town of Portsmouth, Ohio. He was the second son of a truly entrepreneurial family. His father was a crack salesman and sometimes con artist. The folks around the region often said he could sell the fur coat off a grizzly bear. He always had a new scheme to make his millions. His mother, Ma Jessie, was an alpha female, a cunning businesswoman and adventurous, hard when necessary, and soft as a down pillow to those in need. Here's where the story begins. Sometime around the end of the first decade in the last century, my grandfather, Big Dad Waters, set out on a journey to the west, a fur piece from his home in Appalachia, Ohio. As a representative of a major shoe company, this was his current get-rich concept, his job was to open new markets in the old Northwest Territory that stretch as far west as Minnesota. His job was to stop at general stores, blacksmiths, and cobbler shops in towns along the way to sell his wares. His sample kit had all the shoes his company offered, and with a convincing silver tongue, he would make contracts to have the selection of products delivered to those new accounts. It was in this time before the people had automobiles, so my grandfather took his old freight wagon and converted it to what we would today call an RV. I was never told what it looked like, but if it were representative of the other travel salesman's wagons, it was horse-drawn and had flat sides and a flat roof with a fold-out shelf for cooking. Inside were the sleeping accommodations as well as the salesman's samples and kits. It must have been quite a sight. In it were everything that one would need to be self-sufficient on the dirt roads through the forest and across the vast prairies of this new developing wonderful land we call America. What made this trip so extraordinarily special was that he took his youngest son, Jim, with him on that great journey. What I know of the event was shared to me by my father. For most of my life, my dad never shared stories that had to do with our Indian heritage. In fact, he never admitted to being a Native American, specifically Shawnee, until the seventh decade of his life. 
I learned that he was actually ashamed because he had denied his heritage and out of his great fear of being forced into the reservations in the Oklahoma Territory, now the state of Oklahoma. While stopping in a small rural town in Minnesota, my grandfather heard that there was an Indian school in the vicinity. He thought that it would be good for his son to be placed there temporarily, to gain additional schooling, and to be with his own kind, Indians. This would also allow my grandfather to concentrate on the sales in the areas. Well, Big Dad dropped off my father at the school on the following Monday with the promise to return on the end of the week to gather him up for the trip back home. With that, my grandfather was on his way. Fast forward to the mid-1970s, and this is how I learned the rest of the story. I was visiting my parents down at their place in Rocky Fork Lake. Dad and I sought out a, a bit of shade under a giant oak down by the lake's edge to chew the fat. We were both fond of occasionally smoking a pipe while reminiscing. This was one of those special times. As I recall, my dad began it this way. Long ago now, when I was a little shaver, I went out with my pa on a selling trip out west. He continued, This is what happened on my first day at the Indian School in Minnesota. He paused, as if to remember more clearly, took a puff on his pipe, and continued. Right off, the teacher was real friendly, welcomed me into the class and all, hoping to fit in with all the other Indian kids. I respectfully said, Megwitch, thank you in our Algonquian dialect, and suddenly all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to him, speaking in the native language in that school was forbidden, subject to strong discipline. Well, now she yanked me by the arm right up to the front of the class where she cut off my long hair with her big scissors and dragged me back to a closet at the back of the room. She shoved me into that dark little room and locked me in. My dad wasn't prone to being fearful, but this really had his attention. What was going to happen next? He continued retelling the stories of the day. Well, later that morning when the food was brought to the rest of the class, I was given a large porcelain pail with my food in it. Meat and stew, bread, real tasty. Oh, and yeah, there was a clay jug of water. He soon found out that that same pail that he had his food in was also to be used for his toilet. They told him it was washed daily, uh, hopefully with soap. You could hear the class each grade reciting their work and listening to the teacher's lectures, he said. Through the door of his closet prison, my dad applied himself to learning the lessons at hand. He wanted to learn what the teacher had to share. Well, early in the week, they had been given a paper and pencil with which he took notes. My dad's mind was like a sponge, always thirsty for more knowledge. Throughout his life, he never quit brain stuffing. All my siblings have exceptional IQs, and Pop must have been borderline genius. It's important to note that my family on both sides have been blessed with generations of parents who taught them the basics of education even before formal schooling. He continued, From that first day I was never let out of the closet. I slept on an old blanket and wrapped up in my old long coat. I got used to the dark and the door being a loose fit allowed the rays of light in. I didn't like it one bit, but I was getting used to my prison. On Friday, his father returned his promise to see how his son was doing. On entering the classroom and not seeing his boy, he asked the teacher where his gym was. Arrogantly, the teacher pointed to the closet in the back of the room and said, He's in there being punished. My grandfather was never a man to be trifled with, and he held family sacred. I don't know how the teacher lived, for my grandfather had shot and killed more than one person in his life. I can only imagine the rage, anger, and hate and the desire to do extreme violence upon this person, but his dad shared what he had heard through the door. My father quietly sat up in the door and let my son out. We're going home. The teacher made some reply, and then my dad heard a gasp from the kids in the room. Footsteps approached, and a key turned in the lock. The door opened, and as his eyes adjusted to the bright light in the room, he saw his father. All six foot two inches of him standing tall and erect with a pistol pointed at the head of the teacher. Come on, son. We're going back home, his father said quietly. Pop took the papers with his notes, leaving the pencil on the floor and walked out the door. Big Dad still holding the pistol in his hand. 
My dad said a lot of things happened in a hurry. Leaving the school and walking in no particular hurry, they mounted the wagon. Hearing the school bell ring and an alarm, his father whipped the horse to a fast run. For miles, they rushed eastward until darkness closed. They made cold camps for the next three nights until they thought they were far enough east that they were certain that no one was following. They returned home and told no one of the incident. Some months later, the sheriff came to my grandparents' home and told them that the feds had a warrant out for my grandfather's arrest. Living in rural Appalachia, I'm sure that the local sheriff simply told the agents that he hadn't seen my grandfather in some time. He probably said, well, they got up and left. The folks hereabout had no truck with the federal government interfering with the good folks in our hills. I asked my dad if he recalled what his father said about the whole incident, and he replied, My father uttered goddamn their souls to hell. Big Dad never forgave the school, nor himself, for putting his child in such danger. I would think this experience would have jaded my father on education, but to the contrary, my dad went on to garner extraordinarily wealth of knowledge. Graduating from high school, he went on to college in Ohio, achieving a two-year degree in medicine, and then to college in West Virginia, graduating with a degree in engineering. He was remarkably educated, speaking and reading nine different languages, including most of the Romance tongue, as well as Mandarin Chinese and Yiddish Hebrew. He never quit learning, bringing home books and magazines, consuming them with the ferocity of a ravenous animal. When he passed on in his late 80s, the lights had dimmed, but in the recesses of his computer-like mind, you knew he was still learning. Our family story is but one of thousands upon thousands of American Indian stories marred by the colonists' conception of assimilation. This seemed to be a universal attitude towards indigenous. Enslave them into concentration camps, fondly called reservations. They did divide us between family and friends, those who have been placed under the federal protection, and the millions today who can document their tribal heritage, but are ineligible to be recognized as such because of the laws. And one wonders why my people in rural Appalachia, most having American Indian ancestors, have deeply rooted distrust of the federal government. The reduction of the individual's rich heritage and cultures to the lowest common denominator would seem to have been inevitable. To the contrary, wisdom keepers, elders, and storytellers have preserved extraordinary heritage for the individual descendants and for the world at large. Notable works of cultural preservation as such as Zora Neale Hurston's epic, including the Barcaroon, that documented the story of Cujo Lewis, the final slave ship survivor, and her collection of folklore, Mules and Men, are beyond enlightening. Another, Dr. Lily Penlyric's brilliant work, Songcatcher, that recorded and preserved the music of early rural America. This is just but a short list of Appalachian and First Peoples of the Great Turtle Islands authors. For further readings on these matters, please explore the writings of Sherman Alexi, Paula Gunn Allen, Professor Duane Nietiam, Charles Eastman, John Joseph Matthews, and so many more. The history of assimilation and the attempt of ethnic cleansing of our first people's language, culture, and traditions is a morbid part of our history. But we were never, nor will we ever be, victims. The preceding extraordinary story took place before America's first people were even citizens of our country. Many things have changed since then. No one. No one should ever allow themselves to be a victim. Did you have a relative that went to Indian school? If so, please leave a comment below. Thanks for giving us a thumbs up. And please subscribe for more stories like these. Megwitch.